In the last <clears throat> lecture, we ended at the Samurai Leisure and Sexuality. And I was introducing the switch to that topic into Christianity and Western contact in Japan. In this section, this is where it kind of connects the subject matter of the Protestant Reformation in with uh, this chapter. Although the, the textbook, it's called Connections, it doesn't always um, do that so well. Um, or make it so clear. In any case, if you look at this time period here in the 16th century, you have, uh, um, and then moving into the 17th, the uh, Portuguese Jesuit priest Rodriguez, uh, he, you know, if you remember in our last chapter, we were discussing the, um, that mercantilism was setting in in the West, so that there was this religious conflict within Europe and also the expansion of exploration and of creating new markets for Western nations by exploration. So here, uh, this Jesuit priest, he was a merchant himself, a diplomat, politician, an interpreter between Japanese and foreign sailors. And he wrote down observations of Japanese life in Tokugawa, Japan. So here we're really seeing um, some of the first real like contact written down for us to have attainable of West and East meeting together. So what was Jap Japan's response to this? For nearly a century, Japan uh, did develop interest in Catholicism or that form of Christianity. Approximately 500,000 500, Catholics by the early 1600s. It's not the largest numbers, but keep in mind that Modesto, California, where most of you are, are taking this classroom, has um, only a little over 200,000 people. So we have a decent amount. Uh, Hideyoshi, he launches an anti-foreigner, anti-Christian policy uh, that culminates in the exclusion uh, edicts that you can look up in your textbook um, or on the online, the, the ebook where you see the primary text of the closed country edicts of 1633 and the exclusion of the Portuguese. And I would really argue that the anti-Christianity was rooted in the anti-foreign foreigner position, that there were certain rulers that really wanted to keep Japan isolated from outside influences. And you're going to see this theme pop up even within China um, in a bit. And in fact, that's what we're going to do is we're, um, you know, we, we've talked about Japan and we're now we incorporated a little bit of Korean history, and now we're going to talk about um, Ming China. So here we have on the map, again, you see that Japan, Korea, and China are very close and linked together. And this rest of Asia, look down here, we have Vietnam, Philippines, and then up here we have where the Mongols would be coming out. And as we mentioned, the Mongols are always <clears throat> starting something. Uh, at this time, uh, around the 13th century uh, and on. Anyways, uh, China, the Ming Dynasty was one of the world's most mighty and wealthiest empires, and they were finally able to push back the Mongols. This also coincided with persecution of foreigners and a very conservative regime that was desiring to emulate the past as opposed to change uh, and, and do something new. Now, what I'm about to talk about is full of a lot of contradictions that are not necessarily easy to follow. Because there's this kind of isolation, the Great Wall being built, and at the same time there's an expansion of the Chinese power, and for instance, uh, extending control over Vietnam, um, and then cultivating new connections. Here we see uh, trade happening, and this obviously this picture here, the man looks like he could be from the Middle East or Central Asia, uh, some other parts. Um, and so there is contact with the outside world. And then here especially, we're going to talk about briefly Zheng He, or Zheng He as some people pronounce it. Um, he is one of the most famous explorers of China. Now I'm going to kind of, as you see the picture here, I'm sure you're really, really distracted with these disturbing pictures. Um, there's several things of interest. One, he was known to be a Muslim, actually. Six foot six, a very commanding presence. But also, he was a eunuch. Now, different cultures have eunuchs. 
Um, and many times in that court, the, uh, there'd be a man that would have to have his testicles removed or something like that. In China, the eunuchs actually had all of their genitals removed. Here, this is a very painful and tragic um, example that we're seeing of this. And he was uh, um, one of those, uh, but being eunuchs also made you in a special position with the emperor. And so you had political prestige and power, but of course you didn't have everything, right? Now, Zheng He, though, is known more for his travels, not his being a eunuch. And this is a, a map showing some of the explorations that he did, which was very extensive, quite amazing. And you would think that this would have really set China in motion. I mean, here they are doing this major exploration maybe a century or two, maybe I might be off even a little bit, 300 the most before Europe uh, was going to really be setting off traveling. And commerce is going to be really developing. But here's the weird catch. Confucian scholars in Chinese uh, belief systems really hated merchants. They saw them lower than peasants. And so the Ming, Ming era is a mixture of expansion, like, you know, exposure and spreading out, and at the same time a closing up and an isolation of China. It's really kind of hard to explain that contradiction. Essentially what you see is there's officially they were trying to crack down and close up, and at the same time, you know, the markets always dictate, right? People always want to make trade, okay? And in fact, um, China, the Asia and the, and the West are going to also find other trade routes, which I'm just going to skip over right now. And uh, what I'm really going to finish talking about here is um, the fall of the Ming and the rise of the Qing Empire, which is the Manchu conquest. China often found itself uh, finding some of the, uh, uh, being dominated by some of the steppe peoples. Like Mongolia, the Manchus were kind of a similar uh, background. Um, there was no intermarriage between them. Um, the Manchus did attempt, though, to uh, emulate Chinese culture as much as possible. Although they didn't do things like foot binding, which um, the Han Chinese would do. Um, this empire is being brought up because it actually comes shortly after the Protestant Reformation that I showed you, but it lasts all the way up into the 20th century. So this is a very significant empire. And of course, you just well, I just covered a lot of Asian uh, history, but um, this is an important one. So you think about Ming, then Qing. Uh, this is where Tibet was first subdued. So understanding the Tibetan issue goes back and um, you know, basically that's all I'm going to say for now about this. So, um, this chapter did cover a lot. Even in my face-to-face -face class, this was quite a challenge for many of um, the, the students. But I hope you at least got a little taste of some things. And in the email, please, you know, write to me or call me. And I can kind of help clarify certain points that I just briefly went over, which... Um, I always want to just extend to you, okay? All right.